doesn't cost more to deal with climate change. It costs more to ignore it. It's clear from the stock take that countries have not had ambitious enough nationally determined contributions. So we're way off course where we should be. For too long, finance has not been available, accessible, or affordable. So that music sounded like we were watching the intro to Succession, so we're going to all start this panel completely panicked. Um, <laughs> thank you all for participating. I just want to, I, I believe that our audience are not experts on the topic, so consider us educated, engaged, and enthused. Um, Secretary Curry, I want to start with you in that, just give us the lay of the land where things stand globally in terms of climate change and our ability or where we stand in fighting it. Well, thanks, Stephanie. It's great to be here with Anne, an old, old friend of mine. And BJ, thank you very much. And great to be with everybody. Um, where are we? Uh, we're facing a, a, a challenge unlike any challenge that human beings have ever been asked to respond to. Uh, the fact is that th this is not a, a, a challenge which requires us to divine a new algorithm or find a breakthrough rocket science uh, uh, you know, answer to our questions. Uh, this is very, very simple in some ways, but made complex by just lack of uh, global willingness to move and address facts and uh, to deal with reality. Uh, it's part of the fever that has seized countries around the world. I mean, France, Germany, Bulgaria, I mean, you can run around and you all know exactly what's happening here, which is very, very disturbing. So, uh, Stephanie, this crisis, which is a challenge to life itself on the planet, and that's not some liberal lefty sort of, you know, qualification about what's going on. Uh, it's reality, and I'll get into that in, in a moment. There's one principal cause of what is happening to this planet. It's very simple. It's us. It's the way we choose to light our homes, to heat our homes, factories, to trans move from one place to another, whether it's airplane, automobile, or truck, or whatever. We burn fossil fuel without capturing the emissions. And, and therein is the entire challenge. 80% of the emissions that are clogging the atmosphere that contain the heat that then goes into the ocean, 90% of the heating of the earth goes into the ocean, and then the moisture rises from the ocean travels around the planet, and falls in these massive pop-up rainstorms. I was trying to get some insurance the other day on something, and the insurance agent said, you know, I like what you've been doing, but, you know, we're, we're, we're losing $100 billion a year now just to these pop-up storms. That's not even losing to all the other challenges of food production and water and other things. So we're, we're, we're really looking at a situation where globally the world came together Starting in 1988, when Jim Hansen testified about climate warming happening, Al Gore, uh, myself, Tim Wirth, Frank Lautenberg, a bunch of senators whom you recall, we were all part of that. And in 1992, we went to Rio. And even George W. H. W. Bush came to Rio, signed an agreement which was voluntary that we were going to respond to climate. Problem? <laughs> we, we haven't really fully responded the way we need to. Now, that said, folks, our, our clock is really ticking. This is, this is not something where we have the freedom to be able to just sort of play out like, any, like a lot of political issues. You know, I've dealt with China, I've dealt with Russia, we dealt with Ukraine, with ISIS, with U Iran, so forth. I believe, despite all of those other challenges, 
we can manage China, we can manage Russia, we will ultimately be able to work through those things. What we can't do is be indifferent about what we need to do to deal with climate because there is no capacity to, to come back. We are seeing the, the Arctic melt four times faster than the rest of the planet. The Antarctic, it was 70 degrees above normal last summer in the Arctic. It was 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal in the Antarctic. And if you go there, you will see what the impact is. To the naked eye, you can see the beginning of the fracture of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which if it were to break off and, and crumble, and, uh, which is now currently is on track to do, you're, like, you're talking about feet and meters of sea level rise. So for all these people who sit there, and I hear them and you hear them, and they say, oh, you know, you guys are hyping this, or it's, uh, yeah, we've had this in the past. No, no, we didn't have this in the past. 5,000 years ago, we didn't have human beings doing what they're doing today. And now we are doing things that are, that are accelerating this transition. The last 12 months, folks, each month hotter than the one preceding, the hottest year in human history that we've measured. And likewise, I mean, you can run down the list. 50 degrees almost, almost 50 degrees centigrade in India a few weeks ago. A thousand pilgrims died at the Hajj the other day just because of the heat. I mean, what is wrong with people that they can see these things happening and yet they're unwilling to do what we need to do? Now, what we need to do, Stephanie, and Anne will talk about this, and we've all been working on it, this transition is now building up. At the last COP28 in Dubai, we succeeded in the hardest diplomacy there is, which is multiple nations, 200 nations in this case, came together, and we wound up with language, even China signing on, even India signing on, saying that we must transition, this is a quote, away from fossil fuel, accelerating in this decade, so as to achieve net zero by 2050, according to the science. And the words according to the science mean holding the Earth's temperature rise to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Right now, folks, as we sit here today in beautiful Aspen, we're heading to 2.5 degrees centigrade. Now, there's a glass half full, glass half empty component to that. We are looking at uh, the fact that when I came into this job at President Biden's request, and by the way, obviously, when I was running for president and telling people I was going to wind up in the White House, I clearly meant as climate envoy to President Biden. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, but, you know, I worked hard for the U.S. presidential envoy, special presidential envoy for climate. I just wanted two words out of that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> president, U.S. president. Anyway, didn't want him that bad. And special, too, I'm sure. Yeah, special for sure. But... Uh, uh, what we're looking at now, folks, is uh, the ability to be able to move. And that's what is exciting. I'm actually optimistic. Despite all the negatives and what you can say about human, uh, the human factor of being unwilling to really commit and make a difference and do the things we need to do, a lot of people are doing the things we need to do. And we have moved. I was saying, when I came into this job, uh, for President Biden on, a, on, on the inauguration day, we were headed to 3.7 to 4 degrees. Now the IAEA, the International Energy Agency, tells us that we're heading towards 2.5. But here's what's exciting. If we were to do all the things that we put on the table and promised to do in Glasgow, and, two years la and a year later in Sharm el-Sheikh, and a year later in Dubai, if we did all the things, we now have... 155 countries have taken a methane pledge to reduce methane, which is 80 to 100 times more destructive than, than uh, CO2. We have 100 of the biggest corporations in the world have joined something called the First Movers Coalition. So we have Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Salesforce, uh, Volvo, Mercedes, Ford, General Motors, a host of big companies have committed to do things to send a demand signal to the marketplace, so they're buying green now. We have green cement, green steel coming our way. The problem is just not coming big enough and fast enough at scale. But even batteries for storage, which are critical to the full value of, of solar, are, are 
coming through slowly. There are things we could do to speed this up. So, Stephanie, I would say this, that we are on the cusp of a transition that I promise you will happen. We will get to a low-carbon, no-carbon economy. Whoever, you know, it makes a difference who's president, huge difference. But even if you know what happens, the fact is the marketplace has made a decision to move in this direction. The CEO of those major automobile companies, they're not suddenly with the election of one individual going to say, oh, gosh, different person. Let's go back and make uh, internal combustion engine cars again. That's not happening. Last year, for the first time in history, a trillion dollars more went into renewable, alternative, clean energy than into fossil fuel. So this is happening. We have about $2 trillion of venture capital now moving into this space. Not yet enough, not big enough, not at scale, but believe me, it's making a difference. And what the IEA has told us, here's the reason for hope, and I'll, I'll shut up after that. Uh, the reason for hope is that the IEA tells us that if we were to perform all the promises made in Glasgow, we could hold the Earth's temperature by 2050 to 1.8 degrees rise. If we did all the things piled on afterwards at Sharm El Sheikh, we could reach 1.7 degrees. And we haven't yet had the calculation that shows what we could achieve, but it clearly will be more, closer even to 1.5 than where we are now. So... It's a question now of political will, of business leadership, of people standing up and demanding that we do the things we know how to do, provide the finance, which Anne is a specialist at, and begin to break down the barriers to moving at the pace that we humans need to move. And, and um, I believe we can do it, but I'm not yet convinced uh, that we're going to do it and be able to avoid those worst consequences of the climate crisis. VJ, we keep setting these goals, and then we miss them, and then we set new goals. If we keep missing the mark, where are we headed? Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here, Stephanie, and to Aspen Ideas. I think we're here to talk about the most important question, I think, of our generation, perhaps of our century. Um, and I think Secretary Kerry set the frame right. Uh, that is a call to arms. And I think that's a, a way to think about this. The, I followed the UN process in climate change uh, more than 25 years. And uh, it is frustrating, but it's uh, uh, a process of ratcheting up ambition over time. We have seen progress. The way I would frame the challenge, because we were asking the question, where is this $38 trillion going to be coming from, right? That's sort of the damage that are expected. And I would say, look, we start with empathy, raise ambition. And that gets to your question and what Secretary Kerry has been working on at the, at the international level, at the governmental level. But that's how you unlock incentives for capital, where the money will come from, ultimately unleash innovation. I think that's the trajectory we need to think about. I'll tell you what I mean very briefly. Um, the ambition has to come from government and getting together as governments at these international gatherings, but also domestically, as we've done with the Inflation Reduction Act, the infrastructure law, we can talk about the domestic side, but increased ambition on policy, because government will never have enough money. Governments are never going to be... Uh, that 30 trillion isn't going to come from government pockets, let's be honest. Um, but government has the ability to provide catalytic capital, along with the World Bank and development agencies, Agencies, to be more innovative in providing blended finance and setting the rules of the road for carbon trading or for carbon pricing, for um, uh, promoting clean energy, ending subsidies for dirty energy, which continue in the trillions at the moment. And so if governments get the rules of the road right with more ambition, what happens is you unlock that pool of financial capital that there's no shortage of capital in the world, and Anne can attest to this. Enormous amount of capital, but you need the right rules, you need the right incentives so that they see opportunity. And I would put to you, especially given the climate tech <coughs> revolution that's beginning to happen, we're seeing this, uh, an extraordinary time for a range of climate technologies that are now getting ready for prime time to be scaled up. I think we're uh, on the cusp of a decade where we're going to see dramatic changes uh, that are possible to scale up, as well as deployment of things we already have. That's the challenge today is how do we unlock and unleash that capital so that the technologies can be scaled up and we saw a small marker, which uh, Secretary Kerry alluded to. Uh, according to official figures from the International Energy Agency, last year we saw nearly $2 trillion invested in things that could be considered clean energy, green molecules, that energy transition. 
almost double that that was invested in fossil fuels or dirty energy. For the first time, dramatic transformation in the direction of travel. Now, the amounts we need are much more than that, right? By the end of the decade, we're going to need $5, billion per, $5 trillion per year globally, most of it in the developing world. It's not going there yet, but this is how we begin the change. We get the flywheel going with raised ambition and unlocking uh, the capital and creating incentives for private capital uh, to come through. And what is the ultimate price tag? to transition to greener, renewable energy? Who pays for these projects? And ultimately, if we don't do it, who pays that price? Well, that's an existential question. But, um, <laughs> I mean, the, the estimates are anywhere from 6 to $9 trillion a year. So that gives you a sense of the magnitude of the problem. But I, I, I wouldn't really quite look at it that way. First of all, I, I have a... Um, more sanguine view, not because I don't think it's an emergency, I think it's an emergency, and I think it's a chronic problem. We don't usually have an emergency and a chronic problem at the same time, but we do here. So um, when we're in emergency, and I'm going to use America as an example, like a pandemic, the pharmaceutical companies that were developing vaccines suddenly come to the fore and they're able to give them out in the billions. Now, there's controversy around them, but they saved a lot of lives. Uh, John and I were talking last night at a dinner, and um, in World War II, you changed the, munitions, uh, the automotive factories to munitions factories, and we won a war. So... We have the ability to do these things. Right now, we're distracted, I think, globally. There, there are two wars going on. Uh, there's inflation in most parts of the world. There are about 60% of the world is going through some sort of election. Most of that's going to the right, with the exception of the UK, so, and we hope here. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a confusing time. For, uh, and distractions tend to take us off course. But if I could just use a little bit of um, sort of plain vanilla history, the Highway Act, very <coughs> boring, 1956, the Highway Act happens, and the automotive business takes off, the, the building business takes off, suburbs take off, industrial parks take off, more uh, ports become uh, apparent from a Highway Act. But that didn't happen in the f first few years. Space program begot uh, chips and computer chips, which begot Silicon Valley. Takes a while to do. I think the IRA and the Infrastructure Act and Chips Act, not one of them particularly well understood by the American public, and not all the rules are written or they're being sort of managed a little bit. I think once they take off, they will be the fire starters in the same way the Highway Act was and the space program. And then I would just add to that that the um, financial uh, firms are pretty much in. So in 2021, while you were the special envoy, uh, John Kerry got the f six largest banks in America to commit to net zero. Well, the secret there is if six banks commit to net zero, they just committed all their clients to net zero because the way it works is you fix your own operations, then you fix the le electricity or energy you buy, and the third piece of that called scope three is you take care of your entire value chain. Everybody has, has uh, sort of made that transition. It's huge work. I don't know if it happens by 2050, but it gives you a sense of... Talk about a flywheel. That's flywheel on an industrial level. So. Secretary, the United States, do we have a special responsibility in, in terms of the world, right? We're the biggest emitter of carbon dioxide. We're now the biggest oil producer. Do we have a, a greater responsibility than others in helping specifically developed country, developing countries when it comes to transitioning to greener energy? Well, I'm, I'm one of those who believes very strongly that yes, we do have that responsibility. And generally speaking, Republican presidents and Democrats alike have understood that responsibility and tried to put it in play in their policies. Uh, it is only in recent times that we have once again turned as inwards as we appear to be 
And um, I can tell you as a former Secretary of State, while every person who is elected to office always puts their district and their state and their country first, generally speaking, it's not the best diplomacy to run around telling everybody America first. Uh, it doesn't sit very well. But that's so, where we are. Well, of course, but, but, but you don't have to say it. I mean, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's like the Boston Celtics. They don't have to say it anymore. <laughs> um, I know. L.A., I got it. But, but sir, but with all due respect, it's not just saying it. If President Trump wins, right, this isn't just talk. He pulled out of the Pl Cl Paris Climate Accord. It's he not pulled just, out of the Paris Climate what Accord. What will we do to fight climate change? You he now did. have lots of people, including that candidate, who doesn't acknowledge yeah. climate change. And We're all going to work really hard. And the Europeans are going right. Yes, and, the, and exactly. Think about the elections that are taking place in Europe in the last few weeks. They're I'm, going I'm, right. Listen, I've followed them extremely closely. There's a, there's a tangible reason why the world is in crisis today. This, this is not, again, not rocket science. It's pretty basic life and politics. A large number of people in the world feel as if globalization didn't serve them one bit, in fact, hurt them, and they have not profited. People are struggling. Even in America, we see our own fellow citizens struggling to make ends meet, and they don't feel as if the brass ring is available to them anymore. So when you have a divide growing, as we do, between wealth and poverty or or you know, hard times, um, you're breeding insurrection. You're, you're breeding uh, a lack of confidence in governance. And that's what we're living with, folks. We, the government has not delivered in many respects. Now, there are certain people who have adopted that as a matter of strategy, to not let it work. Because the matter you make people, the more they move off into this, you know, place of... of uh, uh, supporting the extreme kind of view of how you can do things. I, I got news for you. Uh, the United States Senate is not not working because the rules of the Senate have been changed. It's not working because the people there don't make it work. And they may be and elected. And when I was there, we, we, were, we went out to dinner with and talked with and enjoyed conversation with our colleagues from the other side of the aisle, and we got things done. That doesn't happen today. And that is breaking the back of our nation. Right now, uh, it, it's we who are our own worst problem. We can deal with China. I kept a dialogue going with China all the last three and a half years. And we got China to step up and, and join us in accelerating our efforts to deal with the climate crisis. But if, if we don't talk to people uh, and we just assert our way and, uh, you know, or the highway for the rest of you, we are begging for a world that is much less functional and much more divided and impossible. Now, uh, with respect to this particular issue, the climate issue, I just want to emphasize uh, that we're looking at, we're not talking about spending money. Mm -hmm. We're talking about investing money for the most part. Do we need to have some concessionary funding that will actually excite and act catalytically to bring private sector to the table because then you have a more bankable deal. You need bankable deals for this money to deploy. And, and it's been hard to get to them. The, the international financial institutions, particularly the World Bank and the, uh, some of the IFIs, have not been able to deliver what we need to be able to attract that capital. But we're now learning. We know how to now. It's beginning to happen. And we've reformed somewhat what the World Bank was doing. Ajay Banga has taken over and is very much committed to moving this capital into the marketplace. We are staring at the largest market the world has ever known, the energy market. There are about a billion people who have no electricity at all today. And there are plenty of people who, and since it's, it's something you pay for, and you pay in many places for water, and you pay for transportation, those, that revenue is the revenue that can support this transition. So it's not as if we don't have the money to do this. You know, when, when the global banking uh, group uh, GFANS came together for, uh, for Glasgow, people felt, you know, okay, we've got $131 trillion of assets that need to be deployed that are at the table. But they haven't deployed. Why haven't they deployed? 
because they don't think they can make money. Now, Ann and I were talking yesterday. Ann informed me that, that ESG, which now is, is, is being assaulted and attacked, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but actually delivered profits of 24.4%. So it's money-making, folks, to be in the business of this transition. And, and it's only going to grow in its need. I'll tell you, we're going to have tens of millions of refugees, particularly from places like Africa or some other countries, where food production craters, where water disappears, and these people can't live. And just as we saw a wave of immigration in the wake of Syria and Turkey and, and the war in Iraq, we will see a wave of desperate migration as people find or try to find a place to live on this planet. Well, Stephanie, that, that last point uh, addresses your earlier question, you know, who will pay the $38 trillion? Um, uh, You know, the sad truth is part of it will be paid in human suffering, right? If we don't raise ambition, if we don't make this transformation work, um, it will be paid, in, in particularly in the lives of those who need to leave where they are, or droughts and in the developing world, that, where they have less resilient infrastructure, where they have less financial markets uh, that are developed, or access to clean energy. Um, th that's the sad truth. That's, a, that's an argument to increase our ambition, not to give up. Um, you had also asked about you know, what happens with the election. Obviously, we're in election season. Uh, here there's, uh, for those who care about climate, climate finance, the energy transition, I assume you're all in this tent this morning for that reason, because you do care about what happens uh, with our planet and the future for our children and grandchildren. There's bad news and there's good news. Uh, the bad news is this is a challenging time, right? Interest rates are high. That makes it harder for clean energy like wind or solar, which tends to be capital-intensive, free fuel later, right? So CapEx intensive industries, it's harder to invest when the interest rates are high. Supply chains are gummed up. So there's some uh, financial challenges that Anne can, I'm sure, illuminate us on. Uh, there are also some challenges. If we were to see a Trump victory, there's no doubt we would see a slowdown in ambition. Outside analyses suggest that maybe a trillion dollars might be wiped out from the energy transition over the next 30 years if the set of policies that are likely to be implemented, not those that are claimed on the campaign trail, but likely to be implemented uh, by a Trump administration were to come into force. But let me pivot to the good news. The good news is we're talking about a transition. We talked about tens of trillions of dollars that are involved, right? So it would slow ambition, but it would not be a U-turn. Here's why. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of operatives in Washington uh, for a, a lengthy story I'm writing for The Economist on this very topic. Um, nobody serious believes that the Inflation Reduction Act will be overturned. It's like Obamacare was, a totem, something to tilt against. But in fact, too many people benefited, the votes weren't there. And it, when you look at what, who benefits from the Inflation Reduction Act, over two-thirds, and on some measures, 80% of the money goes to congressional districts that are red, in red states, to Republican congressmen, uh, who often, even though they make a noise about it in Washington, we all know this, they turn up to take credit for the project, right? Um, and just to give a small example, more than 80 projects worth over a billion dollars each, having to do with decarbonization and clean energy, in Louisiana and Texas, deep red states, are funded by infrastructure law and uh, IRA money that's been counted up by the Rocky Mountain Institute. Just to give you an idea, those projects aren't going anywhere. Those are companies that you would know from the oil and gas industry and engineering sectors, and they're uh, Republican congressmen. They're going to fight for those. So every lobbyist I've talked to even said, we're going to go to the wall to protect a lot of aspects of the IRA. Now, there are some things that are going to be in the crosshairs, electric vehicle credits. They need to be modified. They're unpopular. There's some challenges with how they're being implemented, for sure. And there'll be less ambition. Uh, but broadly speaking, I think the energy transition will continue even if there is a Trump victory. And if you look at what happened during Trump 1, when we did see the U.S. come out of the Paris Accord, that didn't, that didn't mean the wheels fell off the bus overseas. Ambition continued in Europe, for example, in other countries. Uh, we look at China. <coughs> well, where does China fit in all this? The Secretary worked closely with China to bring the Paris Accord uh, and, and what came after back on track. The Chinese are the number one beneficiaries of the clean energy economy, right? They make most of the solar panels, the electric vehicles, the batteries, uh, and other related equipment that goes with the clean energy economy. They want this transition to happen. In fact, because their own property bubble in the financial sector is slowing down, they're doubling down on a world that invests more in clean energy. So I think we actually have multiple wheels globally that are going to keep the, the clean energy transition going and creating markets and availability. There's one thing I do worry about, it is protectionism, that green protectionism, which is very popular 
here in Europe, in India, what does that mean? other places. Tariffs on solar panels, on EVs. <coughs> it's very easy to say, you know, America first, we must build everything right here. And here's something, frankly, the Biden administration and the Trump administration share. And there's a, a mood now for green protectionism. I would urge caution, saying making the cost of green energy more expensive. That's the surest way to encourage a green backlash in America, like we saw in Europe a few months ago. The, the reason people turned up at the polls was they blamed higher prices on the environmentalists and the green parties, right? So I would argue we need to have more free and open trade in clean energy, including so that when we get our own innovation mojo going in America, we can sell our products at a lower price across the world rather than face tariffs ourselves. So I would argue we, you know, be careful about what you ask for with making every small widget that needs to go into a car or a, a, your solar facility here in America. Globalization is the way to go, but thoughtfully, you know, the, not, not the pattern from the past. We can do this in a smart way. Uh, that, so I see positives as well, including that flywheel continuing to go regardless of what happens in the election. And you're in the risk management business. So you just said a moment ago the financial sector is now on board to do this. But we read all sorts of headlines that say VC firms are funding new projects. But when it comes to getting the financing, our largest financial institutions, our largest banks are saying these projects still look too risky. What gets them over the hump? Well, if I can back up the truck a little bit on that one. Um, banks are the last in. However... Um, I oversaw the, the idea of investing in green, if you will, or uh, climate initiatives for 20 years. And 20 years ago, I was hoping in, 20 year, in 10 years we could have done $20 billion worth of financing. I didn't really have any idea how we were going to do it. I just hoped we could do it. Um, we had just built the first lead platinum uh, skyscraper in the United States at One Bryant Park in New York. We had potable water and cogeneration for our electricity, and it was 95 in the summer and you know 50 in the winter, and the you know the toilets didn't flush. <laughs> and six months later, everything was fine. So part of it is like it's a journey. And so, 20 billion, I couldn't figure out, but we were going to do it. A few years later, we were blowing through that 300 billion. I couldn't figure out how we would do that, but maybe we could do that. I would just bring you to the present day, and I would take the top 10 banks in the world who are easily doing $2 trillion worth of, uh, shall we say, climate business. That means it's not very risky. That means it's not, banks don't take risks. They think of everything in terms of risk first, opportunity second. But if you back up the truck, as I said, you begin with venture. Venture only looks at opportunity, a lot of investment. You know, you're always looking for the big payoff because nine, you know, you, you'll have many that won't go well. Then you take in um, uh, private equity. They're at the next, they scale. Private equity scales, that great idea that came out of venture, and they scale to the next thing, and then they together go to the banks and say, let's take this com company public. There's that, I mean, that's what Vijay's talking about in the flywheel in the very boring world of finance. That's how we see it. Um, venture to private equity to um, banks. But if the banks are doing collectively, and I'm just taking some top banks at two trillion, then when you back up the truck, that's what's going on at other companies. I'll use the company I know about, um, TPG Rise Funds. In 2016, they were hoping to do one fund at $2 billion. Hard to raise the money, they got the money, and they started uh, investing and made market returns. Today, 2024, they will close probably at $30 billion. Six funds, uh, no, five funds, 30 billion. That's a 15 times uh, multiple in that short a period of time. And they're not doing it for charity and they're not getting concessions. They're seeing value here. So what I see is that um, venture is uh, making their way uh, 
private equity is doing well and banks are, are kicking in. And then you bring in concessionary capital, which is this MDBs, multi, uh, multilateral development banks, who are kind of changing their stripes of how they do it. There's a thing called carbon credits, which is as you go into your journey of trying to make something happen, the delta in a company between what they can do and what they try, what they need to achieve, the delta, if they prove they've done all they can, because the technology isn't there yet, the cement isn't green, the steel isn't green, you can't do everything by solar, they will buy credits, those credits can be part of the concessionary capital. So that's a product. <coughs> and then I'll just try one more thing, and that is on a history of these kinds of products. In 2009, the World Bank and the European Investment Bank tried to stand up something called a green bond. So it's like a municipal bond, except that if you're doing the bond, and you use a bond to borrow, essentially. Um, I borrow from, Stephanie has a company, she borrows from me, it's, uh, she wants $30 million, and she didn't want to take it out on a loan because she's going to get better economics because I, the bank, am going to syndicate that out, so I have laid off the risk for me too. A green bond says... Stephanie's company is also going to commit to putting solar on or some com uh, component that is green, and she has to prove it at the end of it. So you can see why World Bank, why World Bank wanted to do this. But they couldn't get it going. It took getting the International Capital Markets Association, which is a consortium of banks, asset managers, lawyers, regulators, and NGOs weighing in, and that nascent business in 2009 that they clawed their way to get $2 billion for, by 2014 was only $30 billion. Today it's a $1 trillion business annually. So it gives you a sense of, we're just, we gotta see this for what it is. Go back to the Highway Act, go back to the space program. The IRA, the Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act, to me are like the green bond on steroids. These carbon credits will help with the concessionary capital. And in between, there have been other products. This all works, but it's just going to take a little bit of time. And for the financial world, we sort of work in the world of can, not should. But we can do this because we are doing it. Secretary Kerry, then this takes us back to these projects in developing countries. It's important to do them. Banks are now on board because it's huge money-making opportunities. But... When the private sector are making loans or financing deals in developing countries, that's just going to put these countries deeper in debt. Yeah. How do we address that? Well, you, you, you have to structure deals that aren't going to put them in debt, obviously, and there's a huge backlash to that. One of the things that came out of the Dubai meeting was the UAE's commitment to put $30 billion on the table, $5 billion of which would be dedicated to... Uh, efforts within the Global South. And I think, and that's a terrific proposition, but we have to remember, if, I mean, we've got to balance this. You can have, there are 48 sub-Saharan African countries that equal 0.55% of all the emissions of the world. 48 countries. There are 20 countries, and we are among them, as in China and Russia and others, we are equal to 80% of all the emissions. You don't solve this problem by sort of rushing to say, oh, the Global South, we've got to do this. We have to do what we have to do in the Global South because it's the right thing to do, because you cannot have the Global South left behind. You need to develop it. You need to develop in ways that don't compound the problem. And, and there, there are difficulties right now because there hasn't been money on the table to be able to afford uh, the new technologies and the ways to avoid the, the coal, mostly coal, but also uh, gas and oil that is not abating the emissions. I mean, the problem here, folks, is everything you're hearing from you know, us up here, the three of us, is not based on any politics at all. We have a scientifically arrived at challenge. What we have to do, we have to do some things that are dictated by mathematics and physics. 
and some biology and chemistry, but mostly physics, mathematics. And that is telling us if you don't reduce your emissions fast enough by a certain date and time, you are inviting the worst consequences of what we are doing. That's the challenge here. And, and you know, we can't get lost in, in uh, the so Global South component of it that when I say get lost, you know, that is not what is going to solve the problem. What is going to solve the problem is China, the United States, between the two of us, 40% of all emissions, and then China being 30 of them. And then you've got India, which is coming online with additional coal that is not sufficiently abated. Uh, and you have Malaysia and Vietnam and Indonesia and others burning coal, more coal coming online. And coal is the dirtiest fuel there is, and if it's unabated, it contributes very significantly to the climate crisis, as does the methane, which is now bubbling up in permafrost that's thawing around the planet because of the overall warming. So this is, you know, this is just a challenge unlike anything we've ever faced. And we have to excite. What Anne is talking about is 100% correct. She understands this formula of how to do this better than anybody when it comes to really putting the money on the table and really creating the project that, that will make a difference. But we're not, nothing on the table to date is going to do it at the scale that we need to do and in the time frame that we need to do. That's our challenge. And even when Trump pulled out, for instance, of the agreement, just to reinforce what Vijay said, you know, during the time Trump was in office, 75% of the new electricity in the United States of America came from renewables. Because that's economics driving those choices. And that's what's going to happen going forward. Yeah, just to say that I think that um, I, I recognize some of the, uh, the campaign rhetoric of uh, the Trump uh, campaign, but it is true that the economics may be very favorable, and, and the IRA is, are tax credits for people. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure is fixing bridges and linking grids, and the CHIPS Act is really kind of, for both parties, a, a sort of stiff arm to China. So, Well, it is, but China's cornered the market. China's producing more renewables now. And, 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 and coal plants. And, yes, but they're not bringing the coal plants online at full capacity. They're a hedge against brownouts, blackouts, and, and cratering of their economy because they can't provide energy sufficient. So it's a, it's a hedge. China is producing, manufacturing, deploying right now more renewables than all of the rest of the world put together, folks. And that is going to have a profound impact on China's footprint. Whereas they have a 2060 date for achieving net zero 2050, in fact, because they're deploying all of this renewable, they're going to lower, they're going to speed up and probably beat a lot of other developed countries in, in achieving a balance. So I think the problem... That, just to pick up on that, the, um, uh, we have to be able to keep two competing thoughts in our heads at one time to understand China. I was bureau chief there for a number of years, and that's certainly true, Mr. Secretary. That a, a, a comparable point I'd want to make is if we're looking for where is that 38 trillion, or at least the trillions in the future going to come from, we haven't talked about. I thought one final provocation I could give our audience before we go, and that is, um, you know, Willie Loman, the famous bank robber, was asked, why do you rob banks? And he famously said, that's where the money is. Well, there's a lot of money in OPEC and big oil, right? And I think part of that will come to finance the clean energy transition, and we should make sure it does. And here are a couple of ways that we can make this happen. Among other things, as we get off of oil, the trillions that are sent to the OPEC cartel, I mean, let's remember, it is a cartel. They fix prices so that you and I pay 80 to $100 a barrel rather than what would probably be a few dollars a barrel if it were a market price, right? Um, as we get off of oil, we send less money overseas. That's a start on where that money stays here at home, can be invested in clean energy and infrastructure. But also, we see um, some change in behavior as the big oil companies of the West, as well as the, the national oil companies, the more uh, forward-looking of them, uh, the one in the United Arab Emirates was mentioned, uh, Saudi Aramco, they began to say, hold on a minute, we want to be around for the long, long term, the oil end game. They're putting uh, huge amounts of money through their sovereign wealth funds or through their own investments 
into clean investments, into uh, private equity companies in the West that are investing in clean energy or investing directly into uh, renewables, carbon capture, hydrogen, various technologies of the future. As you, you don't have to love them, you don't have to invite them home to dinner. Um, you know, Exxon is doing much the same with its projects in the, that I mentioned in Texas, Louisiana, the American oil companies. But they're looking for hedges and the huge amounts of capital, 30 billion in the case of the United Arab Emirates, Emirates putting into clean energy investments. But we're seeing um, uh, trillions of dollars that will come, I predict, that can be encouraged or, uh, in our case, withdrawn from the oil economy to go towards a clean economy that's currently being spent in ways that are leading to emissions. We don't have to go that way. So I would say let's find more ways to, to challenge that oil money. Then, Anne, is one of the biggest problems here beyond these specific issues or even these projects, but a, but a problem that goes far, far beyond this, and it, it plagues business and politics, and it's short-termism versus long-termism. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> that's for sure. I, I, I you know, um, there's something that that separates the U.S. from everybody else. It, we always talk about innovation, but it's really innovation with capitalism. That's really what makes us different. We put money. We do the stick, not the carrot. So right now, you've got the stick in Europe of all these regulations around. Um, environmental and climate issues, and the carrot with these acts in the U.S. That's why I think both administrations will, will join into that. I, I would go back to we have seen progress in the United States that have fire starters like the acts I talk about later. And one thing begets another, and you know, you're slow at first, and then it goes really fast. So on climate, if we politicize it, We'll get nowhere. It just everyone fights, and they argue about oil versus solar. It's it's just not productive. If you incent, and you can get the financial markets to see both opportunity and risk. Banks are risk. Venture, uh, private equity, more about opportunity. They collectively are already there. They see it. It's just how big they'll go. It really is how big they'll go. And uh, the financial world unlike other parts of the economy. They don't want to fight about fossil fuels. They want to accelerate the other thing. And we're accelerating the other thing, which is renewables. Those renewables or water uh, uh, desalinization or those kinds of things, those kind of innovations will be applied to uh, the global south. It's unfortunate that the global south will still suffer and... The big thing for me is they're, they're going to want to both electrify their homes and industrialize. And will they go to coal first? Or can we come up with enough innovation at a, at a uh, price point that they can do it? That's both short and long. Secretary, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. But you're going to do it anyway. You, you started this conversation where you said, and this is, this is practical, this is economic, this is for the planet, this is for our future. And you said, this isn't sort of liberal, fruity talk. And you're right. The three of you have just laid out in the last 50 minutes the best possible uh, solutions, none of them political. Every day I cover business and politics, no one has laid out how the CHIPS Act, how the Infrastructure Law Act, how the Inflation Reduction Act helps the country, helps the globe, like the three of you just have. Why not? Because of politics. Very simple. Um, we have resistance for a lot of different reasons. How many of you have seen advertisements for green gas? I mean, that's happening. But there isn't green gas. We have a denial and procrastination that continues to prevent people from coalescing and making a decision. Let me give you another example. Uh, we haven't talked at all about nuclear here. The fact is that in Dubai, we called for a tripling of the deployment of nuclear over the course of the next 10 years. And the fact is that uh, nuclear is part of the solution. Every expert will tell you we cannot get to net zero 2050 without Nuclear. And, the, the, and the U.S. is currently 20%, uh, the energy is on 20%. Yes, of our own energy right now is nuclear. A lot of people don't realize that. You know, in Massachusetts, we get from Seabrook, which years ago was a site of protest. Now it's the source of energy. 
we and, and we have to realize that uh, that uh, give another example of this procrastination. There's about two thousand gigawatts of of uh, potential electric power that's just sitting at FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They won't have made the decision. They won't allow the permitting to take place. You have permitting that takes up to five or ten years in places. Litigation gets in the way. We have to act like this is the emergency that it is. No government has enough money, as I said earlier, to solve this problem. The private sector is going to solve it. But the private sector can come up with the technology, but if they can't deploy the technology, we, we lose, all of us. So the solutions are there. They're coming at us fast. Battery storage is getting better and longer. We're seeing batteries. Germany is now up to about 50% of its power for a very industrialized country coming from renewables. And their target is to get to 80%. Most countries are in the single digits, folks. So we have not even begun to tap into the solutions that are staring us in the face and largely because of the pushback of NIMBY, not in my backyard, or other restraints. We have to behave like we are in a war. Anne mentioned it earlier. The end of World War II, we produced one B-24 bomber every hour on the hour. We had three Liberty ships being built every two days. Three Liberty ships built. This is what we need to be doing with the new technologies, and if we were serious about it and put more visible money and effort into that, more incentive into that, as Ann said, she's 100% correct. The tax, the IRA, powerful tax incentive, $369 billion is what it was supposed to be allocated for. It's over a trillion now because it's geared not to an amount of money but to people who qualify for the credit. And you qualify for the credit by doing the things that we need to do in order to win this battle. We have to decide. Look, people are, immigration's on the table, Age is, I mean, all these issues are on the table, but really, survival ought to be on the table, and we ought to be, we ought to be releasing the entrepreneurial energy of this country and the private sector, and the minute the market, which is already increasingly taking over these decisions, uh, those decisions are made, we can win this. That's what we have to understand. This is, and, and the IEA has made it clear, if we fulfill our promises, we win the battle. If we continue to play the games we play today and we allow the, you know, misinformation, disinformation to run rampant, uh, it's going to be very hard to win the battle. But for this to happen, we need both the left and the right to come together on something. We need a new environmentalism but is that, really that, gonna that builds. But here's the thing. There's actually, I think, a chance here. Uh, it's one of the rare areas of where there's some interest in Washington for bipartisan action. It might be the next, uh, uh, after the election, permitting reform. People, we need to have an America that builds again. And we're seeing this from Silicon Valley. We're seeing this from in, uh, environmental groups rethinking how they consider permitting processes because you can't get climate action if you don't build. And so I think this is the new uh, era on which we can build some bipartisanship, maybe to end on a positive note. Um, we need to go from a country of bananas, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody, <laughs> to a country that builds. I think we're going to end on bananas. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. I sincerely appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.